I mean, you look at a movie nowadays that lists, if it lists 18 producers, that's not out of the ordinary. I've been in the business 50 years, I have no idea what a producer does. <laughs> So here we are on the Sunday special with David Mamet, America's greatest living playwright and screenwriter and the author of a brand new book called Chicago. We'll get right into it with Mr. Mamet in just one second. First, let's talk about your impending death. So you're going to die soon. We all know it. You know it. Hopefully not that soon, but soon enough that you probably want life insurance. 71% of people say they need life insurance. Only 59% actually have coverage, which means 12% of you are procrastinating and another 29% of you are idiots for thinking you don't need life insurance because you do. Normally procrastinating is a bad thing, but if you have been avoiding getting life insurance, procrastinating may actually be working in your favor because while you were getting life insurance or not getting life insurance, Policy Genius was making it easy. Policy Genius is the only way and the easy way to compare life insurance online. You can compare quotes in just five minutes when it's that easy. Putting it off becomes a lot harder. You can compare quotes while sitting on the couch watching TV. You can compare quotes while listening to this podcast. Try it. Policy Genius has helped over 4 million people shop for insurance, placed over $20 billion in coverage. And they don't just do life insurance, they also do disability insurance and renter's insurance and health insurance. So if you care about any of that, they can cover it. If you need life insurance, but you've been putting it off because it's too confusing or you don't have the time, check out Policy Genius. It's the easy way to compare top insurers, find the best value for you. No sales pressure, zero hassle, and it's free. PolicyGenius.com. Go check it out right now. Okay, David Mamet, thanks so much for stopping by. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. So for folks who don't know David's Mam David Mamet's work because they've been hiding under a rock for the last, oh, 40 years of, of American screenwriting and, and playwriting. David Mamet is America's foremost living American playwright and screenwriter. He's the, if you've ever seen The Untouchables, he's the guy who did it. If you've ever seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, he's the guy who did it. And he has a brand new book out called Chicago, which is a gangster novel, and it really is fantastic. You're going to want to check it out. So David, let's start from the very beginning. How did you get into playwriting, screenwriting? How did you get into writing from the very start? Well, I was a, uh, a ne'er-do-well kid, and I used to teach a lot of colleges, and they'd say, oh, you want to have a special group of kids who just want to talk to you, so how would you like us to pick them? So I'd always say, well, just give me the ne'er-do-wells, because they're the only people ever going to mount anything. But the college was never capable of doing that, because, of course, they're set up uh, to put the imprimatur on people who can tell them on Wednesday what the... the Teacher stole them on Monday. But I was a, a, a class clown. I never opened a school book. And people used to tell me, nobody likes a smart ass. But uh, that was the first uh, encounter with authority where I knew they're just dead wrong. Right? And it didn't make any difference if nobody liked a smart ass at all because that was the only choice I had. So that's how I started off. Okay. And uh, where did you grow up? I mean, how did you, what were your parents like? I grew up on the south side of Chicago. And my parents, um, uh, were um, first-generation Americans. Their grandparents are still alive. They were all Ashkenazi immigrants. They all spoke with a wonderful, thick accent. And I guess you don't hear it anymore. And my grandmother raised my dad as a single mom. D didn't speak very, very good English. And they were just marvelous people. So my mom and dad grew up. They courted during World War II. They got married right afterward. And my dad bought a house in something called Park Forest, Illinois, which was the first planned community. It was before Levittown. And it was houses half the size of this uh, the studio over there. And so then we moved to the south side, and I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Okay, and where did you go to college, and, and when did you actually start the writing? Was it in high school when you were being a class clown, or how, how did that get started? Well, I started writing in, in, in high school, and I actually covered sports for the um, Park Forest Star. They paid me like four bucks to cover the high school sports I wrote for them. And then I wrote for my uh, other high school um, literary magazine and I went to college and it was a hippy dippy school called Goddard College in the middle of Vermont and there was no school there. I mean there, there was literally no school there because all the kids of the baby boom generation were trying to go to college and trying to stay out of Vietnam and uh, the school expanded so rapidly that there were no dormitories and there were no classrooms so they housed us in northern Vermont in these little um, cabins, tourist cabins literally without any heat. And we had to hitchhike every day eight miles to this uh, abandoned town hall where there were no classes. So that was that was interesting. Okay, and, and so you started writing there and you were writing your own plays or? or... Well, yeah, you know what? I, uh, as a kid in Chicago, I, I was uh, connected with Second City, which was the first uh, improvisational theater group after the Compass. Compass was Elaine May, Shelley Berman, and Mike Nichols, and then it became Second City. And so as a, a teenager, 13, 14, 15 years old, I worked there as a piano player 
for the kids' shows, and I worked um, as a busboy. And so I used to watch these great comics every night doing sets, right, one after the other. And everything was a seven-minute blackout. And then I started reading plays, and I read that the people that really most influenced me were Chekhov and Pinter, because I realized what Pinter and Chekhov were doing was exactly the same thing they were doing at Second City. They were saying, life is a serial comic uh, sketch, and I'm going to be able to reduce life to seven-minute scenes, which is basically the length of any scene. And to see if I can make you laugh and cry because of the ineffable wackiness of existence. So I discovered this and I said, I know how to do that. Right? It's just like Second City. It's a blackout sketch. So I started writing sketches. And then I wrote sketches while I was at college. And one thing led to another. Well, one of, one of the things you're obviously very well known for is the, the hard-nosed nature of your writing. The fact that everything you write has a real edge to it. And that's not a pun about the movie you wrote called The Edge. But it actually is true that when you read your writing... Uh, it's it's very edgy stuff. Where did that hard nosed sensibility come from? Well, I mean, not everything I not not everything I write is in the is in the Dion, Dionysian vein. I mean, I've also written a whole bunch of Apollonian bullshit. But um, uh, I, as I say, I grew up in the South Side, and I uh, um, my dad did very well eventually, and it was an, as a lawyer. We we're a staunch middle class family, and I was a uh, uh, a nice Jewish boy. Uh, but then I didn't have any money. I got out of college, so I started working at everything in the world so to support myself. So I got a chance to hang out, uh, uh, to be part of the of the actual working class life of Chicago. And and you've written a lot about Chicago. Obviously, that's a, that's your new book is about Chicago, but it's a period piece. I mean, this is obviously written about the, the Prohibition era in Chicago with all the gangsters. It's sort of going over some of the same period time as as, uh, as Untouchables. What about that time did you find so attractive writing about? Because obviously you revisited it. Well, the, the, you grew up in Chicago, at least in the old days, you know, 50, 60 years ago. The uh, the ethos of the Chicago was uh, came out of the gangster era. Uh, everybody talked about the gangsters. Everybody knew somebody who knew Al Capone. Everybody had an uncle who was maybe a little bit bent, or maybe your dad or mom had been a little bit bent. And uh, Chicago was a, a machine town. Right, which is things got fixed after you went up and saw the captain, as we used to say. And if you didn't go up and step up and see the captain and turn out the vote or kick back two weeks of your salary, which happened to my stepsister, she got a job working on the Illinois toll road, and she came back one day and said, they want me to kick back two weeks of my salary. And everyone said, yeah. <laughs> so she, like uh, somebody said, who wants to live in a town where you can't fix a parking ticket? You know, did Chicago work? Yeah. You know, if you were a white guy, Chicago worked pretty well. Now, now it doesn't work at all. I mean, it works better if you're a white guy than if you're getting killed on the south side. But um, it was a working man's town, and it was a machine town. And it became clear that if you want the government to do something for you, you got to do something for them. So that was the Chicago way. Yeah, well, and, and that's that's something even I knew about. My parents are both from Chicago, and uh, it, it was when my dad was growing up there, he said it was still the kind of place where you could wrap a $20 bill around your uh, around your ID when you were pulled over for a traffic stop, uh, and you might be able to get away with it. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we were getting, I used to, when I was a cab driver, we were getting harassed by the cops all the time. I, I'm sure that that's, that that's completely changed. So, so let's talk a little bit about your political point of view, because of late, you've been in some political controversies in the last few years. Uh, you, you're obviously incredibly well known for your writing, and that means that a lot of people who are on the left, a lot of critics who tend to be on the political left, uh, were very complimentary of your work for years and years and years. Do you find that since you've become more overtly conservative politically, uh, that that's had any impact on how the critics treat your work, or have they been fair? Well, the critics are never fair. I mean, that's what critics are. You know, I'm working my side of the street, they work in theirs. And uh, uh, if you're a writer, uh, it's a perfect example of the free market, right? I could spend one, I might spend an afternoon writing an, an act or 15 years writing a play. The audience doesn't care, right? All they know is the price of the ticket, right? They might say, I like it, or I don't like it. I don't have the right to ask them why, right? So it, um, if they don't like it, that's 15 years down the drain, especially in the theater. It opens in New York, they don't like it, you're dead. So uh, interjected into this as all human endeavors, are hangers-on and parasites and camp followers, which is what critics have traditionally been. They've been, you know, some goodwilled people. I was the, uh, uh, a beneficiary of a lot of goodwill, and for example, from, from Roger Ebert uh, uh, and also from Richard Christensen, the Chicago um, 
Daily News and, and the Tribune. But most critics are, they say, what do you need to do to be able to write dramatic criticism? You need to have a lack of talent uh, to write sports. <laughs> so that's true. So uh, some people who, they get cross-decked over to write dramatic criticism, and generally they've been the bane of my existence. I mean, I, 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 I get it. Right, there's always acts of, uh, ants at a picnic. Sometimes they come down in my favor, sometimes they came down the other side. But trying to be a good Jew, I say, wait a second, you know, if I'm going to fetch, when they, when, when they toss my uh, work onto the uh, ash heap, I shouldn't read the, the other reviews, which I know through my sixth bad sense uh, are good. Generally, the, the, uh, you can't survive in the United States as a playwright until you please the people in New York. And since a, a political conversion, uh, the press in New York, has, especially the New York Times, has been vicious about, uh, uh, and uh, it's a peremptory challenge, in effect. And in effect, I wrote this book, which is on everybody's bestseller list, and the question is, how did the New York Times review it? And the answer is, they didn't. Mm. They just chose not to review it. Okay, so well. As they used to say in the 19th century, the doctors used to say, we have to wait and let the disease declare itself. So as we've seen now in our country politically, the disease has declared itself. Because let's talk about your politics. Were you always politically conservative? Did you sort of find yourself on the political right? How did you end up identified as somebody who is politically conservative, Republican, if, if you're comfortable with that label? And where do you find it? I mean, what is your political label? Well, you, you know, label curiously, I'm a, I'm, I think I'm a complete conservative and a, a strict constitutionalist. But when you say Republican, my blood runs cold because everybody I ever knew and everybody who they ever knew was a Roosevelt Democrat. Right. And the, the Republicans were the guys were, you know, with the with the white plastic belts uh, playing golf, uh, at the, at, you know, at the country club. But I wrote a a, a, a political play. It wasn't a political play, it was a farce. It was called November, and it's about a, 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 a president who's about to get kicked out of office because his, uh, what do you call them, approval ratings, as he says, are lower than Gandhi's cholesterol, okay? He's about to get kicked out of office. And so he has this uh, plan where he's going to, it's uh, both the election's coming up and Thanksgiving's coming up, so he's going to pardon all the turkeys and hold up the turkey. So it's a really funny play. So the New York Times back in those days, they were still speaking to me. Oh, by the way, NPR decided I was a non-person too about 10 years ago. But uh, Scott Simon just recently came came back and said, you know, come on, do my show. So that was very nice of him. So they're doing my play November on Broadway. It's hysterically funny. So they asked me to write a piece for the New York Times because back in the days when I was a pre-non-person, that's what they did if you were. So I wrote a play uh, a piece for the New York Times called Political Civility, based very much on the teachings of my uh, uh, great friend and great teacher, Rabbi Mordechai Finley. And he said, okay, we, uh, we said in the piece, we have to be civil to each other. I said, we have to be able to state the other person's point of view in such a way they say, yes, that's what I mean. And then they ask me, and I have to, and they, and I have to be able to state their point of view, and they say, yes, what I mean. And then we're going to reduce facts upon which we can agree. You say, if we can't agree on them, throw them off the table. All we're going to have on the table is facts upon which we agree. And then we'll reason from those facts. And if it come, let us reason together to see if we can uh, uh, arrive at some mutual understanding. So I wrote this thing about political civility. And I said, I find it's also important to be civil to myself because all my life I've referred to myself as a brain-dead liberal. I said, you know, there's a lot of truth in jokes. So I, I said, I have to stop and say, wait a second, why are you maligning yourself? Are, uh, is, is this um, platform something which you believe or not? You know, it's a, it a great middle of the road piece, blah, 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 New York Times, you know. As we say, we, we can deal with the Christians, God help us with the German Jews, right? So I wrote the piece for, oh, wait a second, it was for the Village Voice. I wrote it for the, the, the Village Voice. Meanwhile, New York Times come out and give it play a terrible review. So the Village Voice takes this piece I called Political Civility, and they retitle it, Why I Am No Longer a Braindead Liberal. F front page. Okay, kaboom. New York Times comes back and re-reviews the play November, gives it a worst review, and <laughs> I, find myself, I find myself out in the cold. And um, I said, oh, okay, I got to figure this out. So I sat down for a couple of years and I wrote a book called The Secret Knowledge about politics 
and uh, did a whole lot of reading, a whole lot of thinking, trying to reason my way through to an understanding of the political process, which hurt like hell, because I had to uh, uh, recognize that what I had accepted as the way things are were simply prejudices and examine them to see if I could to see if there was any truth in them or not. So I wrote that book and I found that uh, uh, my friends turned into acquaintances and you know my acquaintances crossed the street. And uh, Ruth Weiss said something great about the great Ruth Weiss. Somebody at Harvard said, you know, Dr. Weiss, uh, what will I do if I tell people what I really think? What will happen to me? And Ruth said, you'll be free. So we'll talk about that in just one second. First, let's talk about your freedom from internet intrusion. With all the recent news about online security breaches, it's hard not to worry about where my data goes. Making an online purchase, simply accessing your email could put your private information at risk. You are being tracked online by social media sites and marketing companies, your mobile or internet provider. Not only can they record your browsing history, they often sell it to other corporations who want to profit from your information, which is why I've decided to take back my privacy by using ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has easy to use apps that run seamlessly in the background of my computer, phone, and tablet. Turning on ExpressVPN protection only takes one click. So here's how it works. ExpressVPN secures and anonymizes your internet browsing by encrypting your data, hiding that public IP address, and you can protect yourself with ExpressVPN for less than seven bucks a month. Ex ExpressVPN is rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you ever use public Wi-Fi, you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing that data, ExpressVPN is the solution. And if you don't want to hand over your online history to your internet provider or data resellers, that's what ExpressVPN is there to do. Protect your online activity today. Find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben for three months free with the one-year package. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben to learn more. Okay, so in the secret knowledge, what, what did you actually discover when you delved into the political system and, and you say that you, you learned some things that you hadn't thought about before? What exactly were those things that, that hadn't occurred to you? Well, nothing had occurred to me because I was a red diaper baby and grew up in the bubble. You know, it was great to hate all the Republicans and great to be a peacenik and great all these things. But what I went back and I, what I understood, I think, was the, 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 the biblical underpinnings of the Declaration and the Constitution, which basically goes back to the Torah on one foot, right? If it's hateful to you, don't do it to your neighbor. That's it. So, I, so I, I, I tried to reason my way back to the bare metal, if you would. And what I came up with was that the Constitution is a compact among thieves. It's people who say, you know, I know I'm not a very good person. I try, but I fail. I know you're not either. Let's see if we can agree on the, the least amount of rules that will get us free of King George III and allow us to keep a, an eagle eye on each other to allow us freedom from government. So this was a concept that, you know, I might have heard the phrase, but I didn't understand what it meant. But then I started thinking. I said, well, wait a second. Every time you get a letter in the, in the mail and that addresses any governmental agency, what's the first thing you feel? It's fear. Mm -hmm. It's fear. And then they wanted to tear down my hedge in Santa Monica. So we bought this house like 20 years ago. It's a big old hedge, right? Wonderful hedge. Great, complete privacy. Marvelous. We got a, a thing in the mail that says... Um, you were in violation of 1943 hedge law. No, no hedge can be uh, more than three feet tall. You, uh, if you don't cut down your hedge immediately, we'll charge you, get this, $25,000 a day. So I start going to the city council. People are weeping, weep, weep, weep. You know, my grandfather planted a hedge, bibbidi bobbidi boo I start looking into it. They're going broke. City of Santa Monica is going broke as all, are all the liberal communities because they've taxed business away. Okay, so they figure, how can I make money? You call, comb through all the laws and find something that you can uh, enforce. So everybody fights them. They fight them in the court. They say it's unconstitutional. It's never, uh, you can't find somebody $25,000 before it's been adjudicated. Then law is never enforced. So what they come up with is this. They say, okay, anybody who had a hedge that's been there for 22 years or more, and you can prove it through blah, 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 you can keep your hedge. But we now have a new um, organization, which is the hedge police. And the hedge police will come every year and they will take a surveyor's transit to make sure that the hedge is not higher than it was 22 years ago. I was thinking, this is all government. It's like I said to my kids, all government 
comes down to the hedge police. <laughs> well, it's it's really interesting because when you watch your movies, there there are a lot of uh, and see some of your plays when when you when you there, there's some lines that have become just part of sort of the American parlance. Obviously, there's the whole the Chicago way speech from the Untouchables or the uh, or the speech that uh, in the movie version Alec Baldwin gives in Glenn Glenn, 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 Glenn Ross the always be closing speech. And a lot of folks on the left tend to use these particular lines actually a fair bit. So Barack Obama famously suggested that you, you don't bring a, a knife to a gunfight uh, in his sort of political heyday. Uh, and people on the left are constantly suggesting that capitalism is this dog eat dog business where people are attempting to tear each other down. And they use that as an excuse for government interventionism. But it sounds like you know, your basic view of human beings, that all human beings are basically at each other. And that's why we have to come to these basic agreements to leave each other alone. Well, yeah, I was watching yesterday that the great Tucker Carlson, I'm crazy about him, he had some cockamamie, I think Democrat, something or other, I don't know, you know, uh, congressman or something like that. And he says to the, the guy, the Democrat, he says, wait a second. He says, you guys got nothing left in a golf bag. So what in the world are you going to run on in the midterms? And the guy says, economic justice and social justice. So I said, well, okay, you know, let's, let's break it down to the, Eng the English language, right? What does economic justice mean at the end? How is that different than justice, right? It's communism. What it means is uh, someone, it's statism. It means that someone is going to uh, stand above whatever rules we have for commerce and decide what's just to whom, right? So as you know, as Tom Sowell said, when every, ever anybody says it's going to help A, you say, well, who's going to hurt, right? So economic justice is, uh, at, at the end of the day, it's communism. It's saying, and communism is someone's going to be in charge of saying what you have to give to me. And I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep what I think uh, I want and give it back to you. Which brings me back to when I realized that the whole, um, the, the Marxian idea from each according to his ability to each according to his need really begs the question. Because the term which is missing is the state shall take from each according to his ability, which means the state's going to determine what your ability is. The state shall give to each according to his name. I'm, I'm the state, I'm going to determine what you need. You don't determine it anymore. You don't determine what your ability is. The state does. So, so much for economic justice. And I thought social justice, how's that different than decaf justice, right? Regular common garden decaf justice, <laughs> right? So justice is drawing a line. That's what justice is, like taking a line of type and justifying it. I'm going to say this is in, that's out. Is there going to be injustice in terms of justice? Yeah, sure. Talmud says, right, where there's law, there's injustice. Okay, great. We're going to have a line, right? Social justice means there's no line. Whoever's screaming loudest gets to say, this is what you have to do. So you say, wait a second, let's refer to the line, let's refer to the law. They say, no, no, throw out that law. The law is insufficient. And I got a guy talking to it surely. He says, well, obviously the Constitution's out of date. How would a 2,000, 240-year document possibly be relevant? I didn't want to say, well, then why are we sitting here reading the Torah? You know? <laughs> but so what I said was, wait a second, okay, let's say it's out of date. How are you going to fix it? What do you suggest? And more importantly, what are the rules by which you suggest we're going to set it, set, go about fixing it? Because social justice is fascism. That's what it means. It means that the group of people who has screams the loudest gets to determine what the law is, and that always ends in murder. So that's a, the, the two wonderful phrases, economic justice and social justice, which don't mean nothing, as the semantists would, would tell us. They mean something. And what, they, what the first thing they do is they're an anesthetic. So, so how, how much should politics play into the art that you make? You, know, you sit down to write a book, you sit down to write a play uh, or a movie. How do you filter out your politics or do you just sort of let it flow? Does it just sort of well, find I think itself? The main thing is like in the last hour of the day, I have to stop listening to Mark Levin. That's, that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> He's a pretty smart guy, but I, you know, he gets tired and, and so I, he gets an, uh, irate and I get irate. So the main thing is for me is uh, listen to the radio a lot less, read the newspaper a lot less. And the, I, I spent like the last couple of years writing es political essays and I just said to my assistant, you know, file them. I mean, burn them if you want to. I, I, I know what I think. Nobody else really cares what, what, what I think. Let me get on with going back to being a gag writer. 
see if I can make people laugh once in a while. Well, one of the things that's driven people on the right absolutely insane is obviously the dominance of the left in the cultural sphere. And my good friend, Andrew Breitbart, who I, I think you knew, uh, Andrew was fond of saying that culture is upstream of politics. The more people are shaped in the country by sort of the culture with which they engage, television, movies, uh, entertainment, because we spend a lot more time engaging with that content than we do with political content. Do you think that's true? Do you think that people... Yeah. There's a guy who wrote a book, his name is Paul Ingrassi, and he wrote a book, I believe, called Crash Course or Crash Something about the merger of Chrysler and Fiat, right? And what he says in that book is really important to me. He says, culture will outdo organization every time. Because culture is the oral Torah, right? Well, upon which the, you know, our understanding of the written Torah is based. Now, uh, so my wife is, uh, every, every year she goes back to visit the old folks at home in Scotland. So I spent like three weeks alone forgiving her, okay? So um, I was watching a Turner Classic movies. I love old movies, right? But they ran out of old movies. So they're running like Lassie Come Home Part Two, you know, <laughs> all of that. I just, and I get it already. How many times can you watch Lawrence of Arabia? So I started writing, <laughs> I started looking at on-demand movies, right? New releases, on-demand movies. And I've just seen a couple good movies over the last 10 years. Most of these movies are garbage. And not only are they garbage, they're a, certain, they're a form of cultural obscenity because they're either kiss-kiss or bang-bang. They're either simulated or non-simulated sex or they're, they're a sadomasochistic, sadomasochistic fantasy of violence. So I'm thinking, well, okay, left, right? Okay, Hollywood, if you're really interested in not mistreating women, don't do don't do the sex scene. Not knock it off. Learn how to write for the love of, right? Because that's why the sex scenes in there. Because people can't write. I say if you're really interested in doing away with gun violence, why do you have a gun in every poster of every movie ever made? Where are people shooting each other? Why are they carving each other up? Well, the reason is that the people who write these things don't have any don't have any skin in the game because they can't write very well. So if they don't get any joy out of figuring out a plot, what they're going to do is they're going to put the, you know, um, Adolf's meat tenderizer and everything, which is either sex or violence. How do you think that that impacts the, the culture? Do you think that that has an impact on politics more generally? Or do you think that it's sort of just the background noise? Like when people go to see a movie, do you think that that actually has the capacity to shift how people think? No, 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 absolutely not. Well, I don't know. But that's good. It's a good question because it, it doesn't have a capacity to make people better, which is the other obscenity that mo movies are supposed to raise our consciousness, right? By, by saying deaf people are people too, black people are people too, gay people are people. The only people who aren't people too, you'll notice, are the Jews. That we Jews are not people too, but nonetheless. So movies don't make people better. So the question is, I think hydraulically, I have to say, do movies make people worse? I got to say, probably not. Uh, with all of that said, do you think that the obsession that people on the right have with sort of left-leaning and bias in Hollywood, do you think that's overstated? Because if, if it turns out that culture doesn't really change people's minds on various issues or play into politics all that much, should we stop worrying about the sort of movies that we see quite so much? And should we kind of let it go? Or, or is it something that the right has a reason to be obsessed with and upset about. Well, what are you going to do about it? I mean, what, uh, what concerns me is blacklisting in Hollywood. Because, uh, you know, I've been in show business for 50 years, and most people in my family are in show business. And uh, I don't know what their politics are, but I know that, the, that I get tales all the time of, and people come up to me on the street, and they'll say, oh, Mr. Mamet, and they'll whisper, so, you know, I read your book, I don't know, man, that's sick. I mean, because everybody who's not above the line, which is to say a featured player in Hollywood, is in the closet if they're a conservative because they'll lose their job. Yep, and, and I wrote a 400-page book, actually, specifically about this. It was very funny. I went into all of these producers in town wearing a Harvard Law baseball cap with the last name Shapiro, and they obviously assumed that I was on the left. And then I would ask them questions about whether they discriminated against conservatives in Hollywood. And they said, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We'll fire people. We'll, we'll try to make sure that nobody can get a job if they're on the other side of the aisle. Here's my theory. My theory is that because the left has taken over the commanding heights of culture, because they've basically decided they're going to sneer down their nose at everybody who disagrees with them, the entire middle of the country, that because of that, the right has responded by saying, we're going to respond politically. We're going to, we're going to take over the, the politics of the country in response to you because we're so angry. We can't take over Hollywood, but what we can do is vote. We can definitely vote. We can get out there and we can vote our people in. And then the left responds to those votes by getting even more angry and making the culture even more degraded. It used to be that there was a common culture we all shared back in the 1950s where people only had three channels or two channels and, uh, and we all watched the same sort of stuff. 
and we all watch the same sort of movies. There was a common background to our culture. And now the culture has fragmented, but is essentially to the left. And people have responded to that left-leaning culture with a right-wing politics. Do you think that there is any hope that culture is infiltrated by conservatives anytime soon uh, or that we come back together? Do you think the political split is just going to get worse, exacerbated by culture? Well, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not that concerned about Hollywood culture. I'm very, very concerned about education. Uh, but there seems to be, maybe I'm crazy, a little bit of groundswell under the premillennials of the saying, wait a second, let me think about this. You know, I don't, I don't want to have my head uh, uh, stuffed full of trash. Um, I don't know. I always thought as I get older that it's not that people change, but rather that they die. So that my generation, you know, one generation uh, passes away, another generation comes up. But the earth, in spite of global warming, ha ha, endures forever. So there's a new generation that's coming out of the, out of the center of the country and out of younger people. And we're going to have a different Supreme Court. And eventually, the people on the left have to stop screaming. I mean, I don't know what they're their program for this wonderful country is other than hatred of, of Donald Trump. That's not a program. It is an amazing thing. I mean, you and I were having uh, lunch, sort of brunch, uh, over in Santa Monica area, and we were sitting there, and I, I've observed this to friends, that we were sitting there, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's a really nice restaurant, and all the lights streaming in. I'm having a Coke, and you're having lunch, and everybody around is having $200 bottles of Chardonnay, uh, sitting there playing with, their, playing with their iPhones in the most prosperous, freest country in the history of the world. And if we had taken a poll of the room, people would have thought that we are living in the shadow of looming tyranny, when in reality, we're living as close to a heavenly existence as it's possible to live on this earth. If you plunked somebody out from 1900 and plunked them down right here, aside from the general lack of values, I think that those people would look around and go, wait a second, if I have a baby now, I can expect that baby to live till 80 years old. If I have a kid right now, I don't have to worry about that kid dying in infancy, and I'm going to survive childbirth. And yet here we are sitting in the richest area of the richest neighborhood in the country, and everybody if you would pull the room, they would think that we are living in Weimar, Germany, and the whole thing's about to collapse. Well, they're enjoying it. I mean, God bless them, you know. But as they say, people who don't believe in something will believe in anything. Here, here's what I think. You go to the newsstand. I was watching, walking past the newsstand today, Newsweek magazine. The terrible news is on the cover is a picture of Betsy DeVos, right, who devoted her life and her fortune to education. And it says, Betsy DeVos's war on teachers. Right? That's the bad news. The good news is Newsweek magazine is now this thin. Right? The week before is Donald Trump, you know, looking down at a child who's weeping, you know, a phony together uh, photo montage. That's the bad news. The good news is Time magazine is now that thin. There's now three people who, sub uh, who um, subscribe to the New York Times, and I think two of them have parrots. Um, so things are changing. Are you optimistic for the future of the country, or do you think that... Uh... Yeah, I feel incredible. You know, somebody said a long time ago, they said, no, a democracy survives uh, more than 300 years. So I think that this new shift to a, 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 a constitutional republic, back toward a constitutional, constitutional republic, is going to lengthen uh, the viability of the American experiment by 50 to 100 years. That's what I think. What do you think? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a little more pessimistic than you just because I feel like the pendulum swings pretty far in this country. And, uh, and it's swung from Barack Obama to Donald Trump, which means that it's going to swing back even further to the left the next time around just because the Democratic Party by default has made itself into a democratic socialist party, kind of a European democratic socialist party. And so when the pendulum swings, it's going to swing back toward a Bernie Sanders or an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, at least temporarily. And that's not good for the country. I, I don't think that there are a lot of substantive conversations being had because people are so angry at each other. And I do think that has to do with a lack of a, a common base of values. Like It sounds like when you were growing up, you were growing up with the feeling that despite all the corruption in Chicago, if you worked hard, you could get ahead. And it was actually your obligation as a decent human being to work hard and make something of yourself. And I feel like there are entire generations of people in this country who have been raised on the premise that America is actually a terrible place that is seeking to put its boot on your throat, and that anyone who proclaims that America is good is a perpetuator of this evil system. That's true, but all these generations who were raised in the bubble, I don't think Starbucks can, can uh, open outlets sufficiently enough to, to keep pace with that growing population. So what are they going to do for a living? 
after their parents die and they're, you know, they're sitting on a couch and working as a barista. I don't get it. Well, that, that's the big question. And I, and I do wonder, you know, whether these folks have a skill set. I mean, well, is, they, they don't. I mean, that's the other thing that gets me. There's, and I talked, I have a lot of kids. I, I mean, I, I want to go live in a shoe with the old woman. That's how many kids I have. But the, we, we talk a lot. And uh, I talk to them and the, some of them experience the great joy of doing something for a living. Yeah, I mean, it's, but I, I don't know that there are that many people in the United States who actually see that. I mean, they, they see, they see, there are too many people, I, maybe I'm the pessimist here, but I see a lot of people in the United States who see work as something to be avoided. Like, they, they attribute all of their stress to work. Work is always a, a bad thing. When they talk about things in their life that they want to get over, it's work. And, you know, for me, my goal is to work until I die, because that's usually how it works. The minute you retire, you're gone, right? So, my, I, you know, my, my belief is sort of the belief from the, from the book of Genesis, which is that you are put on the earth to cultivate it. And the minute you stop cultivating it, there's no reason for you to be here anymore. But I think that there are a lot of people who actually believe that they were put on here, here on earth for leisure time and enjoyment. And the more that we require of you, the harder you have to work. That's an inherent flaw in the country. That it, we're, it, according to Bernie Sanders' logic, we're so rich, why should anybody have to work? Well, Bernie, I think I met him in the old days because I spent a lot of time about the same age overlapping in north central Vermont. I don't think he's ever worked a day in his life. No, so literally. He, he hasn't. I mean, he, he was kicked out of a commune for not working enough when he was in Vermont. <laughs> Legitimately, that's it's an actual thing that happened. And now he owns a lake house, right? So yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great country where you can never work a day in your life and have a lake house where you vacation with Bill de Blasio. Well, the question is, where the question is, which the, the young won't address, is where does the money come from? They say from the government. Well, all the government can do is, is either tax you or steal it from you and, or waste it or spend money on either things that everybody needs but nobody wants to pay for or things that nobody wants. Those are the only two things the government can spend the money on. So the young per- per person doesn't say, where does the money come from? I mean, what I worry about, I'm not sure that it's a, that we have a problem of economics as so much as, you know, a lot of folks on the left think it's a problem of redistributionism and the economic system and all this. I really don't think that's the problem. I think we do have a problem of virtue and heart. I think that I we, we, I think we, there's, there's a giant hole in the middle of the American soul that, that has been carved there by 40, 50 years of dependence on government and a belief that there is no higher calling for you, that your, your job on this earth is basically to experience the most pleasure possible and then die. Uh, and I don't know what replaces that other than a return to some sort of centralizing values. Well, I don't know either, except that uh, I have a di- difficult time controlling myself. I mean, I don't want to even attempt to try to control somebody else. It's going to be what it's going to be. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about compelling people, but I do think that the appeal of a moral lifestyle has always been a hard sell. And it's a, it's a Particularly hard sell when there are no consequences to immorality. Well, there's a very good book on the subject, you know, which is called a Torah. You know, what's the consequences for immorality? It's a, it's a plague or 40 years in the desert or not to think twice about it. So let's talk about your Jewish philosophy because you came from, you said a red diaper doper baby kind of background. Yeah. So your parents were secular Jews? They were very, very secular Jews, and it didn't. That we went, they went to uh, Sunday school, and I mean, let alone a talis, you never saw a, a, a yarmulke. I mean, someone would want a yarmulke that was like these Episcopal Reform temples, they would have been lynched. And I thought a lot about it, and two things occurred to me. One is that Arthur Hertzberg, in his wonderful book, The Jews in America, talks about the Ashkenazi um, abandonment, the, the, that at least a quarter, maybe more than a quarter of the men who came over abandoned their wives. They just couldn't take it, which is a huge uh, secret among the Ashkenazi community. And it happened to my dad. And his dad came over from uh, Russian Poland, just left them. And so my grandmother, single woman, hardly spoke English, raised two kids during the Depression. But if you said to your dad, my dad, oh, you know, your dad abandoned you. He said, no, 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 he didn't abandon me. And I always knew where he was. So as Hertzberg says, it was the, the father who took the kids to show. So if the father is not there, who's taking the kids to show? The other thing about a, a, a assimilationist reform was that these, these the young people wanted to be American. Right? They didn't want to be European. They wanted to be American. Being Jews was, was tough. And they uh, encountered a lot of anti-Semitism in those days. And then, if that weren't bad enough, Europe killed all the Jews. Right? So if there's no upside to being a Jew, which is Judaism and the Torah, and the wonderful Yiddishkeit, all there is is downside. So the people in my Episcopal Reform upbringing went to temple the same way one might go to the dentist. 
They say, I don't want to, but I know it's good for me. And you see that today in a lot of the reform synagogues around here. You know, people go sit there, you know, as if they're watching paint dry and nod and nod and then give all their money to the, the building fund. So what do you get out of it? I mean, you obviously grew up in that environment. What made you kind of return to the value of, of the Torah? Was it allegiance to the past? Was it, was it inherent value in the document? What, what, what is it that you like about, about the Torah? Because obviously that's, a, again, a hard pitch for a lot of young people today. We're becoming an increasingly secular society. Fewer young people are going to church than ever before in American history. Is that true? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I those, mean, even those... among the evangelicals and the fundamentalists? Well, no. I mean, among evangelicals and fundamentalists, it's still a large number. But overall, the number of young people who are going to church has been steadily declining for years. Uh, for Jews, it's always been like eight of us. Uh, among, among the Orthodox, it still remains high. But everywhere else in the Jewish community, it's very low. Uh, what, do you, what is the strongest pitch for taking the Bible seriously, or at least the values of the Bible seriously. Well, think? people should read. I mean, the only thing wrong with the Bible is, as we used to say, there's not enough pictures, right? <laughs> there are more pictures than there. Somebody, you know, is going to take that idea and run with it. Gay goes on to hate. But uh, the wonderful thing about the Bible is my teacher and rabbi, uh, Mordechai Finley, says, uh, people say, is this what happened? He says, no, it's not what happened. It's what always happens. So this is a magnificent compilation of folk tales and literature and how-to and humor. And it's just, it's the history of the West. And if you said this was, oh, you know, all the Jews, they used to call about the Judists, right, or the Buddha Jews, right? They want to become Buddhists. They want to become Wiccans. They want, because they're searching for meaning. Of course they are. But there's a lot, the, the meaning is right there. It's the history of our people and what's what made America what it is. Because all of these people, they, they read two, two books in their life, a lot of them. They read the Bible, they read the collected works of Shakespeare. And they came up with the Declaration of Independence and the, and the Constitution. What, uh, so when I was getting married to my wonderful wife, Rebecca, and we, uh, she said, oh, we have a, have a Jewish wedding. And she was raised as, by, by a physicist and a yoga teacher in Scotland. So people thought religion was nonsense. But generation back, a lot of them are Jewish. She said, we have to have a Jewish wedding. And I said, okay, why? She said, because. So we found this great rabbi, Rabbi Larry Kushner, who's now in San Francisco. We started going to his shul in Sudbury, Massachusetts. And at one point he said, he said, oh, he said, you guys should really learn Hebrew. We said, oh, no, no, we'll learn Hebrew, learn foreign language, blah, blah. He said, no, 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 he said, it's, uh, biblical Hebrew is simple. He said, if you know, on a scale of difficulty, if English is an eight and Hungarian is a nine and Mandarin Chinese is a ten, Hebrew is a two. So he taught us Hebrew. We started reading the Bible in Hebrew. We said, "My God, what a what a great um, what a great gift!" I'm actually going right back. No one has to interpret it to me. I'm going right back to the actual word that was written three thousand years ago. Well, I think what you, what you say about the impact of of biblical kind of foundations on Western civilization. That's one of the reasons why I, I don't think it's the people reject the Bible and therefore they reject kind of the American tradition and the Western tradition. I think they reject the Western tradition and the American tradition and therefore they reject the Bible. They don't like how America turned out and they're upset about things as they are. And so they say, well, then I don't like any of the foundations for, for America either. And it seems like they're angry at the current status. It's not that they decide they're going to be secular and they don't believe in the Bible. It's that they decide that America has too many flaws, that it was based on a bad system and that bad system was based in turn on the Bible. And therefore, we have to be against the Bible if we want to build something better, which is sort of Marxist take on history, I think. Well, yeah. I mean, and, and also, I mean, I haven't been to a lot of, I don't, I haven't been to church in decades, but I go to, to a few synagogues around the world. And most of the Reformed synagogues, I mean, I'd rather drop bowling balls on my feet, you know? Why? You say, why? I don't get it. There's, there's nothing there. So there are some wonderful people among those. Again, I'll mention my rabbi, who's, who's, a, a, an absolute genius. So we go every week and he talks about the Torah and uh, talks for a couple hours on a Saturday. And he, he's an absolute genius, says things that you never, never thought about before because he's devoted his life to trying to understand that document. Well, understanding history, I think, that in, as an Orthodox Jew, you know, somebody who takes it very seriously, understanding history and understanding where we came from, I think if you don't understand that history, you're not going to understand, as you say, America, and you're not going to understand what makes America a wonderful place and, and how we got to this place in civilization in the first place. It's easy to pick off the fruit of the tree after having burned down the trunk, which is, I think, what, what so many people are trying to do right now. I want to ask you, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier that, that the, you think the writing in Hollywood, the, the quality of it has, has declined. Number one, why do you think that is? And number two, if you had to name five movies that are not your own, that, that, you, that you just love, what, what would those movies be? 
Well, um, Galaxy Quest, of course, the greatest movie ever made. <laughs> and of course, uh, I love the uh, Super Troopers. I see they come out with Super Troopers 2. I'm afraid to see it because it's like seeing Gone with the Wind 2. I mean, you know, can't do better <laughs> Gone with the Wind. <laughs> The Godfather is, you know, I think one of the, one of the great one of the great gems of world liter of film literature, and uh, I like The Killing by Stanley Kubrick and Dodsworth by William Wyler. Um, there was a, a little marriage of convenience between so the cinematograph, the kinematograph started out as a, a, a carnival arcade, right? You put a nickel in and it showed you a couple of pictures. And the earliest pictures were pictures of a train coming toward you or people walking down the thing. We go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. They were selling, um, um, they were selling an experience. Then they started as uh, 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 films in, in the late teens went from being a one reeler to being a full length movie. They said, Jesus Christ, you know. We need a plot. How are we going to do a plot? We'll have a story. So they started filming stories, right? And they started going, they went to a lot to novels. They went a lot to um, the theater. They started doing stories. And then when sound came in, 1928, 20, like that, they said, okay, I get it now. We're basically, this is going to be a filmed play. Then as movies progressed, some people got the idea, wait a second, this is a whole new vocabulary. We get to tell the story in pictures and we get to have dialogue. And so you got the, the golden age of Hollywood, you know, in the late 30s into the, into the 40s of some magnificent filmmakers who really understood the, the capacity of film as a new medium. And for some reason, the suits weren't paying attention, right? So a lot of good stuff got made. Then as film got more and more, uh, became more and more a big business, the suits took over. And they said, wait a second, we, we, we can't, we have a franchise. We can't um, put this franchise in jeopardy by having a plot. So if you look at the, the, the late 50s into the 60s, American movies and into the 70s versus European movies, there's nothing very much happening. You know, it's the big franchise, you know, and it's Doris Day as opposed to uh, Sophia Loren. So, okay, so now things start degenerating, degenerating, degenerating. They, they, they took all the back lots. So they just did this at Fox like five years ago. They had the last back lot, I think, left on the, on the west side. And they tore it down to put in parking structures. For who? For whom? I mean, you look at a movie now, they said, list, if it lists 18 producers, that's not out of the ordinary. I've been in the business 50 years. I have no idea what a producer does. <laughs> Zero. Who are these producers? Right? Were there people who are in charge of making sure that we're going to keep the audience rather than people who get a kick out of making a movie? So uh, here, here's a question, because you mentioned sort of the 30s and 40s and, and maybe early 50s is sort of the golden era of movies. And that, of course, is a and not just a common opinion. I think that it's pretty you know, well accepted. What, how much do you think that has to do with, with going back to a point you made earlier with, about the fact that right now every movie seems to be very reliant on sex and violence and basically from 1933 to 1960, the Hayes Code was in place thanks to, thanks to the Catholic Legion of Decency saying we don't want to see any of your, your sex and violence yeah. uh, and so you had to operate around the rules. Uh, you know, one of the theories has basically been that when there are all these rules in place with regard to writing, that actually in some ways makes the writing better because you actually have to write around all the stuff that otherwise would be obvious. What, what, what do you make of that? Well, that's a very good question. I really like the pre-code movies, as everybody does, because they're rougher. You know, the code comes in and all of these, you know, lechers and whores and pimps and blah, blah, who then is now uh, rule Hollywood, said, oh, I'm going to get on my whole own high horse so I can get out of here and snort some coke and go have some illicit sex. There's a there's a great uh, energy to the the pre code movies, but I don't know if that's a causal relationship or just things things got uh, things got too rich that people could not afford. I'll tell you a story. A guy comes to me. He says um, uh, from a big agency, right? He's trying to lure me to the big agency, and he says, "Listen," he says, "We want you to write this half hour television show," and it gives me that idea. I said, "I." I Thanks, it's a pretty good idea. I don't want to write it. He says, listen, you don't understand. He says, if you write this and it goes into syndication after 10 years, you could get $10 million. He said, how long would it take you to write a half hour television show? I said, it'll take me about a half an hour. He said, think about it. I said, I am thinking about it. Wait a second. He said, 
if it t- I get $10 million a half hour, that's $20 million an hour, right? That's uh, $800 million a, a week. <laughs> that's uh, $4 billion a year if I take two weeks off. He says, if you're making that kind of money, you couldn't afford to take two weeks off. <laughs> so what do you make of the changes to the industry right now? So, uh, you know, the, the in- industry is obviously fragmenting. A lot of film is getting made not only abroad, but also by the various independent producers and now it's being aired on Netflix. The, the movie model itself seems to be collapsing in on itself. Uh, it's very difficult for a star to even hold a, a film anymore. It just stars don't have the same sort of cachet in the United States that they used to. Are, are you excited about the future of, of where film is going? Or do you think that TV is where it's at? Well, where do you think the entertainment industry is, is going? Which trend lines should we be following? Well, the only thing I'm excited about in my latter years is taking a nap. So I'm going to let things uh, go on without me as, as they will. But if you look at the 20th century, uh, entertainment and the theater was always changing, right? And vaudeville came in, and the people on stage looked down at vaudeville. And then movies came in, and the people on stage looked down at movies. And so this was the second tier of uh, stage actors who went into the movies. And the same thing happened in radio. Radio came in and the second tier of the of the stage people went into radio and then television came in and those radio people plus the second tier again from movies went into television. They became the huge stars as people were basically C players. And every uh, uh, subsequent uh, iteration of technology drove the other one, you know, we don't have much theater anymore, you know, except for Mamma Mia, and uh, we don't have any vaudeville anymore, nobody listens to the radio anymore, and broadcast television is all over, right? And so now movies are getting to be all over. Okay, things change. So now we're going into the, the uh, we are definitely into the electronic age. The people have been saying for 30 years, wait until the first person figures out how to monetize uh, home video. And now it's here. So uh, I asked you earlier about your favorite films. So what are your favorite plays? Because obviously you're a playwright as well. well what, what, who, who do you think are the, you mentioned Pinter and Chekhov before, but who, who are your favorite playwrights and, uh, and favorite plays if you had to name your top five? Well, I don't like going to the theater because you, there's no popcorn. So the thing about going to the movies, this is really great, is, you know, if you really like popcorn, I love popcorn. So what do you do? You eat down to the bottom of the popcorn and you start crunching the kernels because you can't, because it's the current, it's the, it's the great human dilemma, right? I want some more popcorn, but I don't want to shame myself by going back to the popcorn thing again. So I'm getting, the, so what happens is the last little bit of kernel, you get that little thing stuck in your teeth, you know? And so you spend the rest of the movie picking that out so that the movie doesn't have to be that interesting. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it's really a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad that you could make the time. Uh, folks, if you've not read David Mammoth's latest book, the book is Chicago, you should definitely go check it out. It really is, uh, uh, it, re- it really moves. I mean, it's a, it's a book that, that definitely will keep you awake all the way until the end of it. David, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. The Ben Shapiro Show's Sunday special is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Associate producers, Mathis Glover and Austin Stevens. Edited by Alex Zingaro. Audio is mixed by Mike Caromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Alvera. And title graphics by Cynthia Angulo. The Ben Shapiro Show's Sunday special is a Daily Wire Forward Publishing production. Copyright Forward Publishing 2018.